Hello everyone and welcome to a very important edition of the Immigrant Magazine Weekly. I'm Pamela Anchen. Today's edition is really a sign of the times. With COVID ravaging our planet, a lot of us are busy trying to find ways not to catch the virus. Now, if you're a tobacco consumer or consumer of tobacco products, you are even more concerned because the effects of tobacco on COVID can be life-threatening. Well, my guest today is someone that is sick and tired of watching and witnessing the tobacco industry's relentless exploitation of his community for financial gain, and particularly the youths. I want to welcome Chad Williams, the Community Engagement Coordinator at African Communities Public Health Coalition and Team Leader for the Tobacco Reduction Project in Los Angeles County. Chad will bring us why this is a very important subject matter and why we should encourage our children, our friends, our family to be aware of this trend of exploitation that is doing terrible damage to our community and taking lives leaving us poor, leaving us destitute, and losing lives. Before I bring Chad to the show, do me the honors. If you haven't subscribed, please do so right now by clicking on the subscribe button here below and also liking us so that YouTube will share our content by clicking on the like button. Don't forget to ring the notification bell so that you will be notified when this content is released. Of course, do me the honors Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Pam and Chang and like us on Facebook at The Immigrant Magazine. Thank you for joining me today. So I want to welcome Chad to the show. Hi, Chad. How are you? I'm doing beautiful. Doing beautiful starting the new year on a good foot. That's wonderful. Are you one of those people that are kind of like an activist or is it just advocacy? Because people ask me the same question. Are you an activist, advocate? I say I'm an advocate. What do you think? What do you consider yourself? I think that there's a lot of different tactics to get the, the job done. Um, advocacy can work. Activism and nonviolent direct action is probably the most effective in my point of view. But I would consider myself more of a movement person, a person who cares about building community, who cares about cultivating community that looks like me, that has similar experiences as me, and that's going to hold each other down. So that's kind of like what I'm principled in. That's wonderful. So that brings me to the topic at hand. But before we even get into that, what can to give us a synopsis or a little few words about the African Communities Public Health Coalition? I think it's, I call it African Coalition for short. Yeah, like, like, like it's abbreviated for a reason. Yeah, it's a, little, it's a long name. Exactly. So yeah, um, a couple of words on it is we work on balancing and uplifting black and brown people in Los Angeles. And um, I, I like to think about it as like the mental, the spiritual and the physical and, and finding that balance right in the community. So we work on things like immigrant services, public health, and also um, we're working on uh, just basic mental health. It's like something that's the foundations of our organization. So it goes from the mental health to the public health to the immigrant services and also just really inviting people who are interested into cultivating a great physical, spiritual, mental balance into the community that we're building. That's amazing. I think the community needs that really badly. Mm -hmm. And now uh, let's talk, I think what you're, you, you're focused on is the public health, I'm supposing, based on the fact that you're working on this tobacco exploitation project, right? Yes, yes. Sure, sure. What you do for the African coalition. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. No, I just want to know what you do for the African coalition. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I'm the lead community engagement coordinator. So I build systems. I do the training and the hiring. And also I'm working on doing just an outreach program to bring more people in, volunteers and recruiting, actually, actually hiring as well, hiring more people onto the project to hold the tobacco industry accountable for making billions of dollars off of black and brown people. And the objectives look a lot of different ways. It looks like making sure that folks can live in their house and not have to worry about secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke. It looks like making sure that the tobacco industry isn't targeting kids with their products. It looks like going out to council members and saying, hey, like this is something that's happened multiple times in our community and we wanna cultivate, like I said again, physical, mental and spiritual health that is aligned with what the black community should have. And the tobacco industry just isn't a part of that equation. Wow. 
you know, when we talk about tobacco, I'm always thinking, and most of us just think about who is smoking a cigarette. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's much more, because now you talk about living in a home without tobacco and all these things. So elaborate a little bit on the kinds of products that fall under tobacco. That people so I, I think the I think the more um, insidious one is like uh, vaping. It's like a new one, right? We all know about cigarettes and cigars. And, you know, I lived in a household where my dad smoked cigars, but he would never smoke inside. Like we would never. And then some people are used to that culture of smoking inside. We always knew that uh, like that wasn't something that my mom and my family ever really let happen because it's, you know, it's just uh, out of the norm for us. But vaping is actually one of those things where it's been kind of pivoted as being like the healthy form of smoking tobacco. But it's very new. People, we don't really know like the entirety of the health defects it's going to actually cause, which is very similar to the original like form of tobacco that when people were smoking cigarettes and cigars back in the 50s and the 40s. And then they didn't like want to link it directly to cancer. But there are all these different things that we're finding out as time progresses of like how bad vaping can be for you. A, on the health part, but you know, also on the part of they're marketing it towards youth. They're marketing it towards the children and getting them addicted to not just vaping, right? Like they're getting them addicted to nicotine so that you know they can try out other products. Um, so I, I, that's one of the things that really sticks with me. And um, we're really trying to outline that the whole timeline of in the intention of what the industry is doing. So that intention needs to be really clear. You know, you feel what I'm saying? Yeah, that is really insidious. Think about it. Is I have a feeling that there's a lot of misinformation out there about vaping. Yes, and, it is. So what are some of the common stereotypes that maybe young people don't know that they should know and look out for? And parents especially. All right, so both of them, uh, you know, for me, um, you can get into statistics and you can get into like hard data. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to look at it from the perspective of explaining it to somebody in the most simplest way possible, right? If they have cotton candy flavored vapes and gummy bear flavored vapes, do you really think that a grown adult is the person they're targeting that for? I'm not going for that. <laughs> like, you know, like, like it, 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 if it looks like a horse, talks like a horse, it's probably a horse. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, so like that, cotton candy. Mm -mm. It's like cotton candy is like, come yeah. on. Like there might be some adults who like that, but it's a handful. Like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's the outlier. That's not like the, the intention. The intention is that the tobacco industry is, again, trying to make billions of dollars off of marginalized people and selling a new product and packaging it differently, you know? So um, we're not down with that, you know, because that's bad for the spirit, that's bad for the mental, and that's bad for the physical. So the fact that you are on this mission, it really bugs me in the sense that, isn't there regulation already in place not to target Young in some counties, in some counties there are. So in some counties that you can't sell vapes, like for instance in Carson, they want some protections where you couldn't sell like certain types of vapes within a proximity of a school or in a proximity of a health center or a youth center, excuse me, in proximity of a YMCA, et cetera, et cetera. But in California, you know, we are the model when you look at it, right? Like we're the model for a lot of different progressive policies. So we have to make sure that things are aggressive and things are being outlined in an aggressive manner, especially against hyper-capitalist systems and institutions like the tobacco industry. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that it's the opportunity for us to really create the narrative and make sure that it's being spoken from the people who are being affected versus the tobacco industry controlling that narrative at the very end, at the, at the beginning, excuse me, of a new product, which is vaping. This hasn't been around for that long. You know, yeah. like it's time for us to take control of it. You know what I mean? And hold them accountable before they try to run away with it. Absolutely. I really applaud you for that. Now, I'm very ignorant about this on this subject matter because I don't smoke, don't vape. But so what is menthol? Where does menthol fall in line with all of this? Because I've heard that menthol is bad. Is that the vaping or is that some other product? Well, well they have menthol flavored vapes, okay. um, right? So menthol okay. is just yeah. like, oh, okay. men, men, like you know, they have menthol cigarettes. And oh, okay. historically in the Black community, that's been something that we've leaned on. It's been something very specifically targeted towards Black people. Again, the targeting towards marginalized people. It does fall into our narrative as well. Um, I would say that... And, and this is my point. And, and, and again, 
I don't think that the mission is to shame smokers. Like it's not, the mission isn't to shame people who have, an, who are addicted to something. Cause we all, like we're all not, I don't expect everybody to be perfect. You get what I'm saying? But more or less it's to bring that public health education to what people are doing to their bodies and let them know that there's an alternative and there's a community that supports them. Okay. So um, menthol fits into the conversation, but I don't necessarily think that um, if a black person has been smoking Newports, which is a menthol cigarette for 50 years of their life, you know, we're going to be like, you don't want to be like this guy. It's like, nah, that guy is, have a, he has lived or that person has a lived experience that maybe that led them to that addiction. Right. But we want to make sure that that menthol cigarette that they have hasn't be, been repackaged into something positive for kids to start smoking now. You know what I mean? You know what, Chad? This is not about shaming anybody because For sure, I know. it's not about shaming anybody, but it's about holding the industry accountable because there are people that have suffered the effects of cigarette smoking and, or you consuming tobacco products. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when COVID, at the start of COVID, my husband is a cigar smoker. Mm -hmm. And I remember that he was so afraid. We, it was like not going anywhere because <laughs> yeah. it was like, you know, we didn't know what, you know, uh, COVID plus cigars or for cigarette smoker, COVID plus cigarettes, you know, smoking or any of those things could have on the lungs. Now I have to tell you, I know people that are right now suffering from the effects of COVID on their lungs because they were cigarette smokers. I had a friend that was a chain smoker for years and Ooh, now he's fighting for awesome. life. And I know lots of other people that are, I've heard stories, I've met people. What do you want people to know? Because like I said, it's not about shaming. This is actually about, we're trying to save lives and mm -hmm. also stop the exploitation, exactly. financial gain, you know, and preying on people basically. Yeah, for sure. Have you done a study? Have you found out about the effects of, combination of COVID and tobacco. So one of the surveys that we do is a multi-unit housing survey where we go out and we do outreach, we talk to people, and we um, one of the questions is actually asking people, do you think that COVID has, if you have COVID and you are a smoker, does that have negative effects on you? And most people say yes. Like most people, even the smokers say, yeah, for sure. Like, of course, like, like, you know, you're inhaling, you know, carcinogens, you're inhaling, like just come, like just burnt up smoke into your lungs. And then there's this deadly disease on top of it. But as far as the data and the science behind it, not something I'm going to sit here and say, like, it's a hundred percent a thing, but there is like certain common sense. You know what I mean? What I if, it, it's like a common sense of like, if you're smoke, if you're a habitual smoker for a long time, yeah. you're, you are at risk now because of the the disease that's been, you know, just like if someone has cystic fibrosis, which is a lung disease, right? They're going to be more at risk than somebody else. You know what I mean? So I think that it's a weird combination between calling people in versus calling them out and letting them know there are steps to stop, you know, and there's a community out there that's going to support you, you know? Okay. So let's, let's, let's pivot a little bit because your focus is the exploitation of the community. Why are you so concerned about that when people will say people make choices? It's about choice. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like a privileged power conversation, right? So mm -hmm. the tobacco industry has made billions of dollars off of not just black and brown people, indigenous people um, made off of tr the trans community and the LGBTQ community and marketing towards marginalized communities that haven't had the same power as them they haven't had the same privilege as them. And if you look at the people who run these companies, um, <laughs> do you not think that there's any room for accountability for them? You know what I mean? Like if you wanna, Angela Davis has a great quote. It's like radical means grabbing something from the roots. You know, mm -hmm. of course there are people who are gonna make, who are gonna make the decision no matter what to smoke because that's something that they like to do. But at the root of it, if the marketing and if the propelling of a message is habitual and it's, it's systemically racist and it's systemically targeting people. We have to grab it at the roots. We have to we we have to actually acknowledge that in the at its core, they want to make billions of dollars and they don't care about the people. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think that cultivating a community with that knowledge and that intention, you know, mm -hmm. and grabbing the, it at the roots at the the core of our message is important. Don't get me wrong; there is self accountability inside of us as an organization. If someone is smoking, then there are steps to stop. But it comes from a place of not shame because 
the power and the privilege. How much power and privilege do we as community people have versus a multi-billion or even trillion dollar company that's been around making billions of dollars for hundreds of years? And you're right, um, adults do make adult decisions, but when you're Mm -hmm. making cotton candy, you know, young people are not mature enough yet Exactly. Those decisions. And then by the time they are mature, they're already addicted. Yes. I guess and that, that and it, for them it's all a part of the plan. Exactly. Why you know? are black and brown communities more vulnerable though? Um, you know, we and I think I might be being a dead horse here with you because we all know, like, you know, white supremacy culture and the country that we live in in America has been very, very targeted towards um, you know, like environmental racism is a big, it kind of comes into conversations. Like there's a liquor store on every block in the hood versus having like an Erewhon or a Whole Foods. You know, there's less fresh vegetables in the in the hood in comparison to if you go to West Hollywood and to South Central, you know, those type of things. And it comes with redlining. It comes with a lot of different other systems that we are, a lot of people who have done a lot of great organizing work have outlined, you know, better than me. But I would say if we're talking about tobacco, I really do think that it's a colonization of what tobacco was supposed to do at first. Because indigenous communities use tobacco as a more of like a ceremonies thing. Like when someone will pass away or if they're trying to honor someone and um, and I'm sure the people who are going to watch this who are indigenous, they can probably speak to it a little bit more to, than to me. But they use it as more of like a ceremony and they do smoke it as well. But it's not the form of tobacco that is being sold in markets and stores. It's not loaded with chemicals and it's not packaged to target children. You get what I'm saying? That colonization mindset. So I think that that's kind of like what it is. It's a product that they know that people can lean on, especially people who are going through more stresses through this late stage of capitalism that we live in and also the white supremacy culture that has been pushed on Black people in America. You hit the nail on the head because my husband says his grandmother was a tobacco consumer and she lived to almost maybe a hundred years in Africa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. It, well, she got her tobacco from the farm. Different. Directly. So you're yeah. talking about the chemicals. So we're not, they're not selling pure tobacco in the first place. And, and, and I'm not here to advocate for even any type of tobacco use. Anyway, they're they're tobacco. completely two different things. <laughs> yes. They're completely two different things that we're talking yeah. about here. Right. The tobacco companies are like, they're going to cut corners and they're going to put more addictive properties inside of a cigarette or inside of a cigar yes. to get you hooked. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And they're about the bottom dollar. They're not about the ceremony. They're not about any type of like, um, you know, indigenous practices that come behind tobacco. That's not their bottom line. So it's not shaming a plant that naturally grows on our planet. It's shaming the the capitalist entity that has actually been on the backs of marginalized people and what they've made, what it's become, right? Yeah. I got you. Yeah, it's all those things that they want to get you hooked. Yes, and that's why that person you were talking about in, in Africa, they were able to live for 100 years because they were they were smoking a plant, you know, at that point, you know, and they probably weren't addicted to where they needed to chain smoke oh. 50, cig- 50 bowls of tobacco a day, right? Yeah. That is so true. So how are you, what are you doing in your, on your mission to stop the exploitation? What are the steps? So due to COVID, organizing has gotten harder. Right? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> COVID has made organizing harder. Um, I'm principled in grassroots organizing. So I'm really big on to meeting people where they're at, going out, meeting people, knocking doors. Like I, I love canvassing. I love going out to places, meeting people, talking to them having a quick little nice message and then following up. Like that's the way we're building our team. But one thing that we've been doing and it's been really, really effective is reaching out to the face-based organizations. Cause a lot of them are rocking with us in the meshes cause spiritual, mental and health, they understand how those things work together. Most pastors, people who work at mosques, um, Buddhist temples, they get that, you know? Um, but one thing we really wanna focus on is that recruitment and building a solid base again. Cause COVID to our base apart, and we really want to get the youth involved. We really want to get um, folks who are interested between the ages of 18 to 24 in college involved in, in speaking their truth and being able to shine light to it. So we, we're heavy on recruitment right now starting this year. Okay. So when you're, recruit, you're recruiting 
And what are you doing with, you know, after you've recruited them? What is going on? What are the activities? We want to activate them. We want the activities is we want to get them out, right? And have art builds. We want to plan in this in the next fiscal six months. Um, just places where people can share their stories, maybe make visuals about the tobacco industry. Um, and also, you know, bring their own community, bring like other kids from maybe the indigenous community, bring kids that they know that maybe from the brown community. It's not like just about like it being about black people, but kind of bringing them all together in this coalition to where they can share visual arts about this industry. And then the narrative also is letting them talk about it. Like I always believe that if someone's being targeted by something, they should be the ones speaking. And as an organizer, we're just here to facilitate it. Okay. Is there any kind of resource out there for families or parents or young people who find themselves, you know, ad addicted to this tobacco? And I, would, I, I, would, I would refer them to the AfricanCoalition.org. We have tons of resources on our website and also we have therapists that work for us. Um, so we always are trying to get new people in to actually have consultations. So if something's like hurting your mental and you, you fall into an addiction and it's not just that, like, or, you know, like it's never just one thing, right? It's if somebody's leaning on a substance, usually there's something else going on that needs to be addressed, right? The roots of it again comes into it. So I think that that mental, you're hurting yourself physically and then there's something mental or spiritual that needs to be addressed. Right. So um, we do that as an organization and that's built into our model, so. Okay. It would be nice maybe if you got into schools, have you, because you're working on a, a LA project. What is the LA County Project LA project? What do you call it? Tobacco reduction project in LA County. The CCTP, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it's a state funded project, right? And the name of it officially is the Keeping Our Lungs Safe campaign. Yeah. Um, we've had tons of contact with schools, with previous organizers, you know, obviously, but COVID has been made it very, 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 very hard. Like we had a base built of around 20, 30 kids at one point and it kind of fell apart because of, you know, 2020. So we, we really want to kind of let people know that we're still here, that we're still working on this campaign. We have new organizers, new faces, new energy and bringing that into the conversation. So we're, we're leaning back onto, like I said, again, the grassroots organizing aspect of going out and actually physically getting these people out there but also paying attention to our health, the health of the people that we're grabbing. So um, with the schools, they've been very, I would say the schools have been very careful because a lot of kids are getting sick in Los Angeles and across the country with the, the variant. So um, we just want to make sure that that's played into our process into the organizing element of it. But um, as things get better, the goal is to really have a lot of trainings to where that we can train the youth and to speak to these issues in the way that they feel the most comfortable. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I hope that at some point, because we don't know, COVID has taught us a lesson that we need yes. to have. We're so used to the grassroots meet and greet kind of yes. relationship. Now we have to pivot digitally, virtually. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Oh, so. Yeah, I think that would be, if you've not thought about it, but I'm sure you have, you're quite smart. <laughs> we, we, we've done it, we've done it. And then and the model, you know, the model, all these models haven't been, like, nobody has all the answers. And like to change like, uh, you know, grassroots organizing and the work that we do move, as movement people, right? To change that to everything being virtual, it changes the way that you have to do it. You know, like it changes like a lot of different tactics in it. You know what I'm saying? Because especially as a, a, a organization that works on public health, mental health, spiritual health like we we have to put way more intention to what we're doing than if let's say it was a different organization that that's not their overall message we don't want to get anybody sick so um the virtual is really really important it just the process of getting people in is more effective meeting someone face to face absolutely. in my experience absolutely absolutely well chad thank you so much last words to the community and how they can be a part of your advocacy, activism, there's nothing wrong with that word because you have to be active and really really fight this big guns, but you can't do it alone. So Of course not, <laughs> of course not. It's all about the people, it's all about yeah. the people. So I wanna say one thing is that um, our organization is made up of black and brown people from across the world. Leaders are you know, from Africa, some folks from South America, me and myself, I'm from America, from the South. And I just wanna give like a formal invitation to anyone who really in LA that really wants to throw down with us and work on the and work on the public health side, the spiritual side, the mental side, and bettering that for Black and Brown people in Los Angeles. So just a formal invitation 
Um, Keep Our Lungs Safe is on Instagram. We have our African Coalition is also, .org is our website. So uh, just a formal invitation to reach out to me personally, to reach out to our organization as a whole. Absolutely. And I'm going to leave it that way so that it sinks. Yes. <laughs> and thank you so much. This has really been very enlightening. And uh, I'm even so much more proud because you, as an African-American, you're working with your African community and you're working with indigenous communities. And you're working with brown communities. I am so in awe because, you know, there's so much to be gained when we work together. Facts, facts. The ancestors are all around us. They're all around us in this work. So, mm -hmm. And that's why I love to do it. It's a grounding experience. Thank you so much and all the best. And um, hopefully we put the word out there and that anybody who is struggling with addiction or wants to get involved can go to africancoalition.org. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. Thank, Thank you. you so much, family. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I enjoyed this conversation. I will talk to you soon. Yes, absolutely. So you take care now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. We've come to the end of our show. Thank you so very much for joining me today. I would love to hear what you think about our discussion. So please share your thoughts in our comment section or send me an email to publisher at immigrantmagazine.com. Now be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Pam and Chang and like us on Facebook, The Immigrant Magazine. See you next time on The Immigrant Magazine Weekly.